Welcome to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, a bi-weekly look at all things related to the growing elite clubs nationally, the ECNL. For more information on the ECNL, visit us at www.theecnl.com. Now, here's your host for Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, former U.S. soccer press officer and longtime soccer broadcaster, Dean Linky. I am Dean Linky. This is Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. And today we spend time with the chief medical advisor for the ECNL, Dr. Drew Watson. When we come back, I'll have a little bit more on the incredible bio of Dr. Drew Watson, but specifically, he presented at this year's ECNL Symposium and AGM on mental health and preventing injuries and the tie-in for each. And it was a fascinating discussion that he gave at the coaching symposium. He breaks down the finer points in this interview. And we start that after this message from the ECNL. As the game continues to evolve in the United States, the ECNL remains the standard of excellence in youth soccer. The Elite Clubs National League has grown to include over 200 clubs and nearly 50,000 players across the country with a robust competition platform for teams, educational resources for coaches and clubs, and unparalleled identification and development opportunities for players. Alongside its member clubs, collaborating to create a better future, the ECNL continues to raise the game every day. The ECNL is more than a league. Welcome back to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Once again, here's Dean. Welcome back to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. You know when you've got a good guest, and that is when you bring somebody back for the second or third time. And it's always a pleasure to be joined by Dr. Drew Watson, an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and a team physician for the Division of Intercollegiate Athletics. He is board certified in pediatrics and sports medicine, serves as the head team physician for forward Madison FC as the chief medical advisor for right here, the ECNL, and earned his U.S. Soccer A license in 2001. So like we like to say when he's on, he's a coach too. He also directs the Watson Human Performance Laboratory, conducting research in both pediatric exercise physiology as well as injury prediction and the impacts of injuries on well-being and mental health in youth and collegiate athletes and Dr. Drew Watson welcome back to the ECNL podcast. Dean it's always great to talk with you I really appreciate the opportunity to be on again. Well and you heard the inflection on mental health because you presented today at the symposium which I believe is the most heavily attended symposium in the history of the ECNL you've been around long enough to confirm that this seems really well attended for one right? Yeah, this is a tremendous event. This is really the first time that I've been able to be here, and the crowd was huge, but really just the content is fantastic. The scene here is really great. The overall experience is just really impressive. And that includes your content because, again, your topic injuries influence mental health, and then you dove into well-being and sleep, and sometimes just simple things like that well-being and sleep are so important but at the end you know really tying back to this mental health epidemic that certainly was lit even with further furor because of the pandemic for sure so let's dive in not everybody was here obviously this is for all of the ecnl membership so give us the key talking points in your presentation injuries influence mental health yeah so the the first part of the talk was really kind of highlighting some of the work that we've done collaboratively with one of the ecnl clubs over the course of three years to look at different risk factors for injury And the big take home was that all we really did was ask them every day about their sleep, their mood, their stress, their soreness, and their fatigue, collected their training load every day, and looked at injuries over the course of that three-year period. And what really stood out was that things like mood are a tremendously powerful predictor of injuries. That even separate from things like training load, when players come in with impaired well-being, they're much more likely to get injured. When players come in without having slept well, they're much more likely to get injured. 
and we sort of walk through the ways that we've been aggregating this data and implementing it within that club setting to reduce the risk of injury. And what we found over that three years when we were using that information to guide the training for that club, we cut our injuries in half to about a third of sort of the typical injury rate that we'd see in female soccer athletes. So the big take home for me was really that we have a lot of available information to help guide player performance and reduce the risk of injury by simply asking them how much are they training, how are they feeling, how much are they sleeping, and then using that to be prescriptive about their training week to week. You may have just answered my next question, but I'm going to go ahead and say it again. How did you know that you cut it in half? Yeah, so really what we did was collect data for the first year and try and get a sense of how these different risk factors react uh, interrelated with each other and influenced injury risk. And then over the second, over years two and three, we basically looked at each age group within the club week by week. And at the start of the week, we would look at their sleep, look at their well-being, look at their prior week training load, and make kind of broad recommendations about how each group was doing. So that might mean that the 17s were looking particularly fatigued or stressed, and this might be a week that we go a little light. The 15s, on the other hand, are looking really fresh, and they could maybe go a little harder. And we apply, we looked at the injury rate that they had over the three years, and by the time we got to year three, it had reduced in half compared to that first year where we just collected the data. Okay, so real, real information. When you talk about well-being and sleep, in your study or just in your own expertise as somebody who's got this incredible resume that I just rattled off, what are the most solid indicators on why somebody's well-being or sleep is not where it needs to be? Yeah, I think this is such an, such an important point. And one of the things that we really tried to drive home today is that there are a lot of things we affect about young soccer players' lives as their coaches and as their soccer clubs, but there are a lot of things that go into their lives that are totally separate from soccer. There are academic loads, there are family stresses, there are financial stresses. All of those things can affect their well-being as well. And the only way we know whether they're in a good position or in a bad spot is if we collect the information from them. So asking them about their well-being and asking them about their sleep can give us a better sense of how things are going for them overall, not just kind of relying on our expectations from what we've been doing within a soccer context. Because if we think that poor sleep and poor mood are going to be big risk factors for injury for soccer athletes, those are going to be just as much a function of what's going on in the rest of their lives as it is a function of what's going on in their soccer life. But we wouldn't know unless we asked. And so collecting this relatively, you know, low cost and scalable sorts of data collection to get that kind of information, that really affords us an opportunity to have a better picture of where our players stand so that we can intervene to reduce the risk of injury. Going to take a quick break and we'll come back with more of our visit at the ECNL Coaching Symposium and AGM in Las Vegas. Dr. Drew Watson, the Chief Medical Advisor for the ECNL, will have more with Dr. Drew after these messages. The ECNL is pleased to announce Quick Goal as the official goal provider and partner for ECNL Girls and ECNL Boys, a new partnership created to support the growth and development of the country's top players, clubs, and coaches. At all national events, including national playoffs and national finals, the Quick Goal Coaches Corner will provide hospitality and social space for ECNL girls, ECNL boys, and collegiate coaches. Quick Goal will also be the presenting sponsor of the National championship winning ECNL girls and ECNL boys coaches of the year and the ECNL girls and ECNL boys goals of the year. Quick Goal looks forward to helping the ECNL continue to elevate the standards of youth soccer and provide more opportunities to players on and off the field in the coming years. Nike is a proud sponsor of ECNL Girls. Nothing can stop what we can do together to bring positive change to our communities. You can't stop sport because hashtag you can't stop our voices. Follow Nike on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 
Huddle is a proud partner of Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Huddle's powerful yet intuitive solutions make it easy for coaches and athletes to be at their best. And now it's more affordable than ever. All ECNL clubs can get 25% off on Huddle and Huddle Assist, the game breakdown solution. Clubs of 10 teams or more can take advantage of the exclusive ECNL club package pricing. This bundle includes Huddle and Huddle Assist for every team and makes your club eligible for Huddle Focus Flex. The all new portable smart camera with full huddle integration at one affordable price. You can bring the best end to end performance analysis platform for soccer today. Just go to huddle.com slash pricing slash ECNL. That's huddle, H U D L dot com slash pricing slash ECNL. We're here with Dr. Drew Watson. Before we came on the air, you told me that the smartphone started in 2007 and it's interesting as we live our daily lives it's a lot about uh, perspective and you know everybody at the end of the day most important is yourself right like and then everybody else kind of gets the benefit with your family and that type of thing but you know 2007 was kind of a big year for me because that's when the big 10 network launched so i didn't realize that that was the same time the smartphone is and my point is from 2007 to now I got to believe it's mind blowing the mental health epidemic and what that graph looks like. This is a podcast. We do have the benefit of some video here, but can you kind of paint the picture of the difference between 2007 when you first noticed it because of quote social media or smartphone and it wasn't really even social media then, right? To where we are now. Yeah. I mean, it's always really hard to sort of pinpoint true causal relationships. I mean, what you can say is that among adolescents and young adults in this country, suicide rates started rising steadily in 2007. Mm-hmm. Between 2007 and 2017, suicide rates doubled in high school girls. And what's really unnerving is that they tripled among 10 to 14-year-olds. Now, it's hard to say specifically this is due to social media or the advent of smartphones. Those things were sort of evolving around the same time. But what we do know is that COVID has really exacerbated this. About a year ago, we saw the American Academies of Pediatrics and the American Academies of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry declare a national uh, children's mental health crisis based on rising emergency department visits for uh, suicide attempts and mental health emergencies. So we recognize that on top of an existing prior mental health epidemic, COVID really sort of doubled down on that. And as, as much as I will be the first person to say that I think sports are extraordinarily beneficial for mental health, athletes aren't really exempt from this mental health epidemic. They're suffering as well. And we saw this in our work early in COVID when we were hearing that about 40% of our athletes were experiencing moderate to severe levels of anxiety and depression in the early COVID shutdown. Some of that has improved as we've been able to return to sports. But we're still seeing levels of anxiety and depression that are higher than they were historically. And I think this is really going to continue to be a big priority, not just among athletes, but among children in general for years and years to come. So actionable items to help to slow down that curve of this mental health epidemic. Do you have some you can share? Yeah, I mean, some of the things that we talked about today were ways that specifically within soccer organizations, they can start to normalize conversations around mental health. Perhaps the biggest barrier that we have to taking care of kids with mental health issues is the pervasive stigma in our culture that just makes it more difficult for them to come forward and seek care. So we talked about ways to have conversations with players where we just normalize this individually or as groups. We can come together and Just like we talk about whether athletes are sore or fatigued, we can talk about whether they're stressed or whether they're anxious, and we we can make it so that the people they interact with through soccer can be individuals they can go to to have conversations about it. We talked about ways that clubs can develop relationships with community uh, mental health resources. For example, clubs often have relationships with a physical therapist or physical therapy office or even a sports medicine organization. For this, in the same way, they can set up relationships with a community sports psychologist. I guarantee in every community that these clubs are coming from, there is one of those who would love to have that relationship Brilliant with Brilliant and necessary, right? Yeah. They, it brings them business, and it is exactly the type of person that they want to interact with. Are young athletes who are really looking to address the underlying issues to help them get better. 
that allows coaches to be a place that players can come but that they can quickly plug them in to an available resource so that they don't feel like they have to serve as their mental health provider. They can just be someone who can connect them with the resources so that they can get help in a way that allows players to maybe more easily access it than they otherwise would. And as far as you know, do you know if ECNL member clubs are putting that into place or at least trying to? Well, I certainly hope so. I mean, I've had a few conversations here specifically about that, and I think it's a relatively novel idea. I mean, it is only recently that clubs have started to have these relationships with physical therapy and sports medicine offices, recognizing that that can reduce barriers to access. We certainly talked about it a lot today, and individually I'm having the same conversation with folks kind of one-on-one, so I'm hoping that it becomes more of a standard practice now that we can recognize what a big need it is. The study that you did, is it public knowledge, the club that you worked with, or is that confidential? Uh, We've never actually really listed it. I don't think it's particularly confidential so much as I think that the intention of it was that it could generalize to other groups, that it wasn't really specifically about that club. It was really just recognizing that if you collaborate with a group that you can sort of integrate what you're doing into the operations of a youth soccer club that you could potentially have the same sort of outcomes and the same sort of relationships regardless of who it was. When we come back, Dr. Drew Watson used the notion of well-being and sleep as another couple of indicators that affect mental health. We'll ask Dr. Drew Watson about that well-being and sleep again after these messages from the partners of the ECNL. ECNL Boys is partnering with Puma for the second year, driving sport forward with the leading products and the next generation of pros who wear them. Puma has proven themselves as the fastest sports brand in the world, the fastest innovation, the fastest players, and the fastest products in the game. They're the perfect partner to complement the speed and talent of our teams. In keeping with their mantra of forever faster, Puma introduces the world's fastest boot, the Ultra. The only boot engineered for speed, the Ultra combines a woven upper with a lightweight outsole for direct forward motion, speed, and acceleration. It's the best in the game, designed for the best players in the game. Soccer.com is proud to partner with the ECNL to support the continued development of soccer in the U.S. at the highest levels. We've been delivering quality soccer equipment and apparel to players, fans, and coaches since 1984. Living and breathing the beautiful game ourselves, our goal at Soccer.com is to inspire you to play better, cheer louder, and have more fun. Visit Soccer.com today to check out our unmatched selection of gear, expert advice, and stories of greatness at every level of the game. From athletes just starting to turn heads to some of the best athletes to ever play their games, Gatorade shows that they are the proven fuel of the best. For the athletes who give everything, nothing beats Gatorade, the studied, tested, and proven fuel of the ECNL. Welcome back to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. I am Dean Linke. Had the great opportunity to sit down with Dr. Drew Watson at the ECNL Coaching Symposium a month or so ago in Las Vegas. When we went to break, we were talking about the fact that Dr. Drew Watson also ties in well-being and the lack of sleep as some indicators for potential mental health issues. We pick up our interview with Dr. Drew Watson addressing that exact topic. Now, when I'm thinking about the fact that you used, again, well-being and sleep as just kind of one indicator that could lead to mental health, which then could lead to injuries and even worse, the S word, you know, suicide. What are some key tipping points there to see, hey, that person's struggling with their well-being. Hey, that person clearly is very tired, fatigued. Yeah, I mean, I think it's twofold. So we we talk a lot about sort of instantiating these kind of monitoring programs so that you can identify people who have kind of a real dip from the norm, right? There are going to be people who have different levels of mood and stress and fatigue more generally. But when somebody really has a sort of precipitous or noticeable drop, there are ways that you can use that in order to initiate a conversation with them and identify what's really going on. And if you have these sorts of resources in place, then you just sort of serve as an individual who can help plug them in with what they really need. But again, I think maybe the biggest difference that we can make 
is within all of these sports contexts, if we just have conversations about mental health, right? When you meet with groups at the beginning of the season, for example, bring in a sports psychologist so that they can talk about it and deliver resources to people. As a club, you can hand out resources about mental health. And then individually within the training context, the same way that we have conversations with players about all sorts of things, we can bring up mental health issues so that it just makes it that much easier for them to come to us when they need something and don't otherwise know where to turn. Action item again, if somebody is listening now and they're like, hey, I like that idea of getting a psychiatrist. I like the idea of having, you know, little tipping points to keep an eye on our players. And they want a little bit more insight from you as the chief medical advisor. Are you accessible or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, what I did up here, I I don't have much of a social media presence, but I sort of blasted my email on every screen that I could, and I've really just encouraged people to reach out. And since we finished up, I mean, I've had a lot of people just come up directly to talk about it. I know that the ECNL is tending to... uh, to distribute, you know, the slide deck from the presentation we got so that the things that I talked about are available to people. But beyond that, I really just encourage people to reach out and contact me. I think the easiest way is just through email, and then we take it from there. How about that email? Sure. So it's just my last name, Watson, W-A-T-S-O-N, and that, and at ortho, O-R-T-H-O, dot WISC, W-I-S-C, dot E-D-U. We've already covered a lot of heavy and heady issues, and maybe this isn't fair, but since we don't always have this kind of access to you, I do want to talk about even suicide with high achievers. You know, seeing all the high achievers here and even talking to Marguerite Awazasa, who was an assistant coach for Stanford before taking over for UCLA, made me think, of course, of Katie Meyer, a high achiever, like 4.0 student, world-class goalkeeper who hit a bump in the road and decided the best way to solve the problem was to take her life and as you reflect on that she's not the only one where do you put that as far as the bucket of the mental health epidemic and what are your thoughts on it yeah i mean obviously suicide is a huge tragedy and i think what we need to get comfortable with is treating it the same way that we might if someone died from cancer, for example. I think the true shame is when we approach suicide as something different than a different disease and somehow make it more difficult to talk about or somehow put some layer of shame around the act itself. People die of suicide. People die of heart attacks. What we need to be doing is approaching mental health the same way that we approach mental health in order to reduce the risk. This is going to be a pervasive problem for a long time. And the more we can build in operations that help get people the, need, the help that they need early, the more potentially we can help them before they do get in a position where they ultimately do die of suicide. I'm big on last word. If people missed your presentation, if for some reason someone just tuned in right now and they know that we have the chief medical advisor for the ECNL and Dr. Drew Watson and your topic was injuries influence mental health. If you only had this one sound bite right here, right now to get your message across, here's your opportunity. Uh, all right, Dean, I've got two. And the first is I would say that in my opinion, sports are perhaps the most impactful way that we have to improve the physical and mental health of children in our country. That's number one. But number two is that to me, that isn't even the real true promise of sports. What's really on offer here is that it's perhaps the best way for kids to learn the lesson that if you really, really embrace doing hard things, if you really come to enjoy doing hard things, you can learn that the limits you think you have are imaginary. And you can realize that you have so many more options and possibilities that you thought that you did. This is why sports are such a big deal to me, such a big deal in my household, and why so many of us reflect on our time as athletes when we're younger and realize that the lessons we learned within youth sports affected our ability to go out and do things in all sorts of different areas. That works for me. It's always great to spend time with you. Thanks for being with us here. Dr. Drew Watson, an incredible background, but uh, for us, 
We love him as the chief medical advisor for the ECNL and the fact that he also is out there coaching as well. Dr. Watson, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Dean. It's always my pleasure. Chief medical advisor for the ECNL, Dr. Drew Watson, always a great guest. I want to thank all the great people at the ECNL, especially Andrea Wheeler and Sydney and Jackie and everybody that was at the symposium getting the video part of these interviews as well. Of course, we've got to thank Christian Labors and Jen Winnego and Doug Bracken and Ralph Richards and Jason Cutney and the entire ECNL family, as well as our producer, Colin Thrash. For each and every one of them and all of you, we'll see you in two weeks for another edition of Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. I'm Dean Linky. Thanks for spending time with us. Thanks for listening to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. For more information on the ECNL, visit us at www.theecnl.com. And if you have a suggestion for the show or a great idea for a guest, please email us at info at theecnl.com. Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast is an ECNL production. ECNL, more than a league.